Thank you. Thank you very much. And hello, everyone. Thank you. And especially those of you who have been attending this SSCR Ideas uh, lecture series, which I think has been very interesting, at least for me. We've had a whole range of different discussions of India, of South Africa yesterday, of the United States, uh, of uh, the Eurozone, and uh, Thailand. So we've had a wide range of uh, different discussions. What I'm going to do today is not actually look at any particular country, but try and look a little bit more globally, specifically at the gendered implications of this on the, on the, uh, and its relationship, if you like, to the macroeconomic processes that are unfolding as we speak. So I'm going to actually share a PowerPoint that I have here, which, um, is it showing? Can you see it? Is it showing? Vikas? Vikas, is the PowerPoint showing? Hello, Vikas, is the PowerPoint showing? Yeah, I think it is showing. The okay, thank you, thank you. Okay, uh, so uh, what I'm really going to uh, look at uh, is not so much any specific country. I wanted to just put out a framework for thinking about this. Uh, because Can this you is... maximize the, the presentation? Just maximize oh, yes, the of course. Sure. Yes, here we are. Okay. So what I'm uh, hoping to do is actually set out a framework whereby we can look at this issue of how particularly the COVID-19 pandemic is playing out in terms of the macroeconomy and what are the gendered implications of this? How would one look at this as a feminist economist? And what difference would it make if we actually looked at it through a gender lens? So just in terms of isolating the issues, let's, let's begin by looking how this pandemic is actually affecting macroeconomies. Now we all know that it depends obviously on the extent of the spread of the disease and the famous shape of the curve that so many of us across the world are now obsessed by. Is it flattening? Is it rising? Is it curving? And, and so on. This is very, very different across different countries. And it's probably the case that most of the developing world, for example, is still very much on the rising part of the curve. We haven't really experienced the full force of the pandemic yet in many of our own countries. In the developed world, it's not even very clear in some countries that have experienced a very, very dramatic increase in it, whether it's over or whether it's flat or whether it's declining or whether there would even be, as many have argued, a series of waves of it. So all of this would affect everything. It would affect economic activity. It would affect the nature of the containment measures. It would affect how, you, how it would impact on employment and livelihoods and everything. But what we have also realized is that uh, the macroeconomy is massively affected by the severity and the length of the lockdown measures. And these again have varied hugely across countries. Uh, there are some that have done very little. Uh, many developing countries have gone in for very extreme lockdown. Many others have managed with relatively light restrictions on mobility. There are of course global restrictions uh, in terms of travel and so on, but otherwise there's a huge variation and that too affects the economy. How these restrictions in turn affect employment and livelihoods depends on how much workers are protected and whether there are automatic stabilizers in the economy. Automatic stabilizers like an employment insurance or a basic income that is provided to people if they do not have employment or if there is some other things uh, that keep uh, being provided so that other forms of social protection that keep being provided so that people can actually access what they need to survive during a period of lockdown. This uh, is much more extensive in most of the developed world as we know there's much greater social protection and worker protection and there are more automatic stabilizers. But even in some developing countries there are many more than in others and I'm going to talk about that in a minute. The other impact on the macroeconomy will depend on how much financial sector collapses. Now, it's not the, the difficulty with the financial sector is that, of course, you know, we, we all have these images of these big fat bankers who manage to benefit when everybody else is suffering and so on. But it's not just that, it is that, you know, finance 
unfortunately still remains the basic, uh, especially credit, remains the sort of lifeblood of a market system. And so when finance collapses in different ways, whether it is in capital credit or unable to pay their loan uh, repayments or unable to access insurance for what they are experiencing. And all of these financial collapses translate into real economy measures and real economy impacts. And that too is something that affects the macroeconomy, the extent to which those systems operate and uh, the extent to which they affect uh, economic activity, employment, livelihood, and so on. Especially for developing countries, there's a lot of dependence on the external sector. Uh, trade, foreign trade is now a very large proportion of the national income of many economies. And in addition, you, we are very dependent because many of us have open capital accounts. So we have a lot of capital coming in and out. Tourism is a very important revenue earner, especially for a lot of small economies. Remittances is very important. Remittances from work abroad. So all of these things and the degree to which we're dependent in turn affect what's happening. So these are, if you would like, the global headwinds that e economies face. And then, of course, there are all these impacts. The government has to respond. So to what extent is the government in question responding? What kind of fiscal stimuli? What kind of monetary policy changes? What are they doing to actually affect, uh, to uh, counterbalance these uh, impacts on the economy and on livelihood? And that, in turn, also has uh, domestic macroeconomic impact. Then, of course, I mentioned that the global headwinds are very strong. We've, we've seen them already. There's a complete collapse in global trade. The, w, uh, the World Trade Organization estimates that it's already 30% decline in the current quarter. Uh, and it's affecting both volumes and prices. In other words, you're selling less and you're getting less money you're selling per unit. So uh, dramatic decline in exports huge i mean travel has more or less stopped except for absolutely essential travel tourism has absolutely stopped capital flows have ended up being the worst possible uh, impact because we've had a dramatic series of outflows from developing countries not so much from the developed world but developing countries the emerging markets have seen uh, more than 100 billion uh, outflow in just uh, of April. So it's a very, very sharp uh, reversal, which in turn gives you currency depreciation. And so when your currencies depreciate, it makes it even harder for you to service any external debt you might have. And so both the um, public debt that is held by governments and private debt held becomes much more expensive to service because you now have to pay many much more in your own currency. And of course, the foreign currency uh, that you used to be getting from exports and from tourism and, and our remittances, all of that has declined very sharply. Insurance is a big one that hasn't blown up yet. I want to just flag it because it will blow up. Uh, we don't realize, we, are, we tend to underplay the significance of insurance, but you know, that was one of the things that actually added to the global financial crisis when it happened in 2008. And we're going to see in a few months a dramatic uh, implosion of a global and national insurance company simply because they would be unable to cope with the kinds of uh, pressures on claim settlement that are going to come to them after the pandemic. One major area that is, I think, undercovered in a lot of the global discussion is the emerging food crisis, which is actually quite significant. Uh, already, the the, the World Food Organization, uh, FAO was estimating something like 183 million people in extreme food crisis countries. But we now know that that's many, many more. And we now know that this is uh, because this pandemic has also affected food supply situations and trade, uh, that there is a much greater degree of aggregate food shortages in many countries. But even in countries that do not have aggregate food shortages, in India, for example, where we have massive food surpluses in terms of excess food grain stocks held by the government, we know that there is extreme and rising hunger because the pandemic has destroyed livelihoods and therefore the ability of people to access food and to purchase food. And so uh, food 
uh, supply and food access have become significant issues that have both external and internal implications. Now, all of the things that I mentioned also have an impact on fiscal space. And what is fiscal space? Well, it's actually all in the mind, but it's basically what governments think they can do and how much they think they can respond, which has partly an economic component, but I would also argue a very significant political component. And that in turn determines the responses, which we will find have particular, very, very strong effects, uh, class effects, gender effects, and, and other macroeconomic effects. Okay, so what I'm going to be looking at here are, are it's twofold. The, the standard way in which we look at things from a gendered perspective is to say, well, you know, uh, here are these macroeconomic processes. What's the impact, uh, the differential impact on men and women, on boys and girls and so on? I mean, how does it impact on, how do all of these processes play out differently for women relative to men? That is an important looking at that. But I also want to look at the other side, which is to say, how does the fact of how gender relations are constructed, the gender construction of society, how does that play out on macroeconomic processes? And how does the fact that, let's say, there is particular occupational segregation of women, the, how does that impact on the macroeconomic process and then in turn on how we deal with the pandemic and our ability to deal with the pandemic? How does uh, what is going on in terms of uh, 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 remittance incomes, how does that depend gender uh, divisions in terms of who the migrant workers are and so on. So I'm going to be looking at both of these issues. And I'm going to be looking specifically on the impact on women along different dimensions, okay, women as workers, and of course, women as workers in many, many different kinds of ways. We know that uh, there are paid workers, or women workers, who could be in formal activities with uh, a proper contract, with a reasonable degree of security, uh, perhaps with some kinds of worker protection and so on. There are women in informal work. And of course, if everything changes, then you're, you're much more at the mercy of all of these, shall we say, naked market processes uh, when uh, they unfold when you have, are on an informal contract with very little in terms of worker protection. And similarly, the self-employed tend to be largely uh, exposed to these, uh, these very strong forces without any kinds of countervailing protections. And then there are women who are in unpaid work. Vast majority of women are involved in unpaid work. Some are only involved in unpaid work in social reproduction and in other unpaid work, you know, or, uh, unpaid helpers on, in family enterprises, women working on family farms who are not recognized as farmers, women helping out in families shops, women working even in manufacturing enterprises and so on. Uh, some of them are solely unpaid, some do both. They pay, do paid work and unpaid work, but it, all of this will impact you differently depending on where you are along this continuum of work. Then, of course, there's a special case now of women who are frontline workers dealing in the pandemic. And we're going to see that, in fact, most of the frontline workers who are involved in dealing with the pandemic directly and indirectly are women, uh, not only in terms of health, but in the associated activities in health, including in, in sanitation and in food distribution and a whole range of other community services, which are absolutely those that are directly involved in dealing with the implications of the pandemic and uh, therefore more exposed to all of the concerns there. Then there is the fact that a lot of women are migrants and they are not just migrants along with their families or their husbands, but they're also migrants uh, themselves for their own work. And this happens internationally. There are a growing number of international women migrants for work and within countries. We, in, we can see in India how many of the women, the desperate migrants who are being forced to trudge long hundreds of kilometers back to their homes. So many of them are women, sometimes pregnant, pregnant and lactating mothers or very, very elderly women and so on. We also have to think of women as human beings which basically means that you have to think of them not just as workers, but 
in terms of their survival needs, uh, access to food, access to healthcare. And one very major concern is precisely that, that a lot of the access to healthcare is not only dramatically altered by the fact of the pandemic, and it becomes all the more important because of the pandemic, but that it's harder to access the kinds of healthcare that were earlier available, precisely because so much of health infrastructure and amenities and services have been directed towards dealing with the pandemic. And so many other very normal uh, medical procedures or health uh, interventions have been either postponed or delayed or simply not provided, whether it is something as essential as child immunization, or it is women who are having to uh, go through childbirth without having assisted personnel or go to a proper facility for it. So a lot of those concerns have also emerged in this period. And then finally, I want to look at the impact in terms of relational inequalities. That is the fact that what's a relational inequality? You know, economists are obsessed with distributive inequality. We're always looking at who gets how much of what and looking at that interrelation. But I believe that sociologists and political scientists have something, they know something more than we do when they talk about relational inequalities, which are ultimately about power imbalances, the ability to control others, and the ability to express yourself in a hierarchy with others. And all of those have very significant implications, as we know, particularly in gender relations, uh, power structures and patriarchal oppression within households and communities. But then there are, there are those very complicated issues of what, are, what we call intersectional inequalities. That we know that in, in India, a woman from a minority community uh, has a very different position from one in a, uh, in a majority community. Somebody from a, a particular caste has, a, has many different kinds of interlaid uh, oppression that they have to deal with. Uh, people from ethnic minorities, people who are migrant communities in another country, people who have different linguistic origin, all have different, they face different kinds of discrimination and uh, exclusion, which are separate. So I think those intersecting inequalities also play out differently. The, the macroeconomic processes, the labor market processes, all of them play out differently depending on these intersecting inequalities. So it's just to note that all of these exist. So I mentioned that it's not just that the economic relations affect women, but it's also that gendered relations affect economic processes. The most fundamental one is, of course, the ability to use the cheap labor of women. Of course, it's uh, gender wage gaps are critical and the ability to extract cheap labor has been an important element of capitalist accumulation certainly in the Asian region and pretty much, I would say, everywhere across the world. And now we are finding that these gender wage gaps are likely to become much more important on adjustment processes in the post-COVID scenario, when the absolute destruction of bargaining power of workers because of so much unemployment and so much destruction of livelihoods will actually generate even larger and more significant uh, changes in women's wages and their ability to access decent work, work in, in basically good conditions at, at reasonable wages. There's also the fact of occupational segregation and the fact that so much of women's work is concentrated in what is broadly called the care activities. Um, you know, uh, it's not just domestic work, it's nursing, it's healthcare, it's uh, early childhood education, it's uh, a whole range of, of social reproduction, because so much of it women do anyway in unpaid form, it's also assumed that they will be better at it or that they are concentrated in those activities in the paid labor market as well. And this in turn has particular macroeconomic implications, which I will talk about uh, in a minute. We all know that there's a huge amount of unpaid work, right? I already talked about it. But unpaid work is a very useful thing for capitalism and for governments, because since it exists and since it will be provided when there is this massive necessity because many things just have to be done you can't say we will not go without cooked food if the if the raw food is available somebody will have to cook it uh, that it is easier to shift the burdens of adjustment onto unpaid work within households we've seen this in every capitalist crisis and it has typically happened with the active connivance of the state because 
the state brings in austerity measures which reduce uh, people's access to basic services. Those basic services still have to be met somehow, so they are met through unpaid labor within families, within households. And this is something which is going to be even more marked, I think, at present. So it is the existence of unpaid work, which is very much part of the gender construction of society, uh, which enables capitalist societies uh, to experience crises and somehow smoothen the impact in the aggregate because they're able to shift a large part of the adjustment to these women delivering unpaid work. Gendered migration, I think I already mentioned about, uh, and the differential impact on remittance incomes, I'm going to talk about that a little bit more uh, later on, and also uh, the differential health outcomes that uh, we're going to see. Now, I don't know how many of you can actually see this, and I realize that it's uh, it's actually very, uh, <laughs> it's not very easy to read, my apologies. Even I need my glasses to read this. But the idea here, this is based on a very recent ILO document, and this is looking at the current impact of the out uh, crisis on particular sectors. And the last column here is the share of women in those sectors. So the green sectors are the ones that where there will be relatively less impact. And uh, education and human health and social work, it is assumed will have low impact. I think that's being optimistic because I feel that austerity measures when they come will actually have an impact on these as well. But right now, these are not immediately impacted. And here, women are a majority, 62% of women in education and 71% of women globally in health and social work. So, uh, you know, it would appear that there is a significant share, uh, women have a significant share of activities that are relatively less uh, impacted by this current economic devastation. Agriculture is the sort of low medium, it's in the middle somewhere, as you can see, the slightly darker green. 37% of uh, the uh, workers are women here. But then when you go along, there are two areas which are fairly high or at extreme risk of losing employment. And uh, one of them is arts, entertainment, recreation, and other services, where women are 57% of total employment. This is the global, okay? This is across all countries in the world, the ILO's estimate. Um, and uh, about nearly, you know, nearly three out of five uh, workers here are women. And this is a reasonably high likelihood of job loss. As you can imagine, a lot of the whole um, entertainment industry is completely affected by what has happened uh, in the pandemic and by the lockdowns. But the other one, which is very significant, is accommodation and food services. This is basically your you know, uh, hotels and hospitality and restaurants and things. And 54% of women, uh, workers are women here, so more than half. Once again, it's a very high risk and a lot of job losses here. They are around 38% uh, in real estate and manufacturing. But in wholesale and retail trade, and particularly in retail trade, women are about 44% of total workers. And we know that when women are in retail trade, they're concentrated in the extremely uh, low end of this, usually. That is to say they are uh, small hawkers, small retailers, people who work in department stores, people who work at the bottom of the supply chain very broadly. And a significant risk for women workers here. But this is, if you like, the risk of just immediate job loss right now. And we find, if you take the US as an example, where they actually track the labor market every month, that already it's women are facing higher job losses than men, okay? So in April, 5% of the job losses were women. And the open employment rate, that's the chart that you're seeing on the left. I don't know if you can see the little line. That's the difference between female and male unemployment. So the black horizontal line there is the zero. That's, there's no difference between men and women. There was a period when women's unemployment rate was lower than men's, uh, but it has been, it's been catching up. And very recently, as you can see, the, it, the line just shoots up. So that right now it's 2.7 percentage points higher than for men. Okay, so very significant and very dramatic change in the un open unemployment rate in the US. Now, this is actually very different from past recessions. Uh, you never really had that in the past recessions. Men were disproportionately more unemployed. 
because women tended to be uh, uh, employed in the service sector and in public services and in things that didn't immediately, you know, it wasn't like manufacturing and construction, which would immediately close up. Whereas in this particular crisis in the US, sectors like restaurants and hospitality have been completely affected. And of course, more women are employed there. But it's also the case, this is not showing in this data, but it is also the case that this is just the unemployment rate. And the unemployment rate, as you know, is the share of those who is openly looking for work and unable to find it out of those who are in the labor force. But we find that also there are more women dropping out of the labor force. And this has happened because of the lockdown, because of childcare responsibilities. Schools and nurseries close, somebody has to actually be around to look after the children. And it's true, everybody's around, but typically all those responsibilities, guess who does them in most households and families still is women. And so they're disproportionately dropping out for these kinds of responsibilities. It's worth noting that when you lose a job in a recession, and this has been found in the US, but also pretty much everywhere else, it affects your lifetime employment chances. It actually leads to lower wages and less secure employment in future. And that's actually quite significant and important because it means that since more women in the US are losing jobs right now, it will actually impact on their future employability and uh, employment conditions. And what's happening in the US is probably happening in a much more extreme way in other countries. We don't have the similar very, very recent data to check on it. Okay, now let's look at the fact that the way the pandemic has really played out in most countries right now is in terms of work has been not in, in terms of the chance of being infected, but because of lockdowns, closures and restrictions on economic activity and mobility. And so a lot depends on how severe those pandemic control measures are. So this is a very interesting chart, which actually uh, is also from the ILO and it's telling you how uh, severe lockdowns are relative to how much of your population, how much of your workforce is actually informal. So on the, uh, the vertical axis, it's the proportion of informality to total employment, okay, and uh, going up to 100, right? And on the uh, horizontal axis, it is how stringent have been your lockdown measures. So the further along to the right you are, on that horizontal axis, the more stringent have been those measures. And it's very interesting that the most stringent measures have been in India and Pakistan, okay? Uh, the size of the bubble basically tells you relatively how many workers are affected, how many informal workers are affected by this. So uh, India, which has the highest share of informality, has also had the most stringent uh, lockdown followed by Pakistan. Uh, Nigeria has very high informality, but only half the degree or only 40% of the stringency that uh, India has experienced. Indonesia has a reasonable amount of informality, but it's very, very uh, low. It's much more lax in terms of the kinds of restrictions that it has imposed. China, as you can see somewhere in the middle, Brazil quite relatively stringent, but much more formal work uh, and so on. Now, what does it mean? Now, remember that this is just total workers, but women we know are disproportionately informal, okay? We know that um, wherever there is informality, the chances are that there will be much greater informality among women workers than men, okay? And this is global. This is not just uh, in developing countries or India or Pakistan or any other country, it's across the world. We also know, and we can see from here, that some of the most stringent lockdowns have occurred in the countries which have the most informality in labor markets, okay? So that they're likely to actually lose their jobs or certainly their wages over this lockdown period and if they're self-employed a substantial amount of their livelihoods. And many of these countries are not just very uh, poor in terms of formality, that is they have a high proportion of informality, but they also have very low social protection. So they don't have those automatic stabilizers like unemployment insurance or other forms of income that would allow people to cope over this period. So I want to just put that out there. In terms of the impact, I think it's worth talking specifically about women in agriculture because, uh, you know, this lockdown has had very peculiar effects. 
uh, lockdowns across the world, again, it's not just particular countries, have impacted on agriculture, necessarily, even when agriculture has been explicitly excluded from lockdown measures, because they affect transport, they affect your ability to access workers, they affect inputs that agriculture needs, they affect your ability to cope with sudden changes, weather changes, and so on. They affect access to markets and taking your products to markets or get being able to get it sold. And all of these are, of course, why, uh, you know, they're common across farmers. But women farmers and women who are engaged in agriculture tend to be disproportionately worse off. Typically, they are not recognized as farmers. They're often, as I said, unpaid helpers on family farms, or even when they do actually the farming themselves, uh, they don't have, hold the land title or they, they, they cannot access the government programs in the same way. They cannot access bank credit in the same way. They don't have the same access to markets and inputs. In many societies, they are prevented by culture from particular types of activities like plowing, for example, which means they have to hire higher labor so all kinds of specific problems of women in agriculture, which ground reports are telling us from uh, different parts of India and Africa, that uh, these are actually problems that have got exacerbated in the lockdown period. Another area where we, women are facing differentially different concerns are uh, with the case of women running micro enterprises and self-employed. Now, these micro enterprises are typically the ones run by women are typically in the most affected sectors. Uh, retail trade, you know, uh, women's in time sides or in so on. Uh, women uh, engaged in catering activities. Women engaged in a bunch of other service activities which are, uh, you know, involved in, in these kinds of sectors. And uh, these are among the most affected sectors. And once again, typically, they are very informal. They don't actually have access to a lot of government support. They are typically so small, that is they're micro, they're not if small, they're micro, they're tiny, that they're not even eligible for many of the kinds of measures that governments are proposing even during the pandemic to assist them because they, they would not be able to access the, uh, you know, let's say any concessions on bank loans because they never had bank loans. They were forced to take informal credit uh, and that kind of thing. The other area which is quite important and significant is the microfinance institutions. Now, microfinance institutions have become very significant all over the world, and especially in the developing world, as uh, seen as ways. I mean, of course, there was a period when there was a lot of celebration of them, thinking that this is a way that women can get out of poverty. There's less enthusiasm at the moment, but it is still um, it is. Uh, still seen as some, one of those things which a lot of women are involved in. And across the developing world, there is a, still a push to get more and more women involved in microfinance institutions. Now, typically, these are, involve fairly high interest rates, uh, repayable monthly, and they have also been very rigid. So we are talking about interest rates from of between 20 to 40 percent, sometimes even higher, which basically means that these are things that you have to repay every month at very, very high rates. And when you have absolutely no income, that's a serious problem. And these microfinance institutions, many of them have not declared moratoria. Some governments have asked that they should declare moratoria, but I don't think it's been made compulsory anywhere. And certainly governments have not yet stepped in to actually uh, ensure that they will do the repayment or, you know, cover the costs in that period. And so this has become a major score, uh, source of concern. The, the problem with microfinance institutions also is the group lending. So that if you can't repay, it affects your entire group. And there's a lot of peer pressure in terms of that you know, necessity to repay no matter what. And so the issues with microfinance, again, ground reports are telling us that this has become one of the major concerns, even among women in migrant families in different areas or women in rural areas who have lost uh, access to whatever income they had uh, because they cannot repay and they're really concerned about how that would play out in terms of not just their access to the microfinance institution but their social relations because their peer group will be very angry with them. 
I mentioned earlier that there's a lot of unpaid work done by women, not only as uh, workers in social reproduction, not only as women within the household who are doing all of the direct and indirect care activities, but also as unpaid labor in family enterprises. Now, these are, of course, you know, uh, a lot of it comes from the basic, you know, patriarchal structure of families whereby the men control the economic activity and the income that comes from it and the women assist and support and so on. Uh, but these unpaid uh, helpers in family enterprises officially don't lose jobs because, you know, they were anyway not really paid. So they're not seen as people who have been unemployed and therefore they're not even eligible for any, many of the schemes and programs that different governments have brought in for those who have been recently unemployed. And that too is an issue which uh, hasn't really got on the policy radar in any significant way. Women migrants, as I said, they're both external and internal and the external migrants I'm going to talk about in a minute, but internal migrants is a very, very huge issue. And women who are part of migrant families or who have migrated on their own have very, very specific concerns, which are different from the concerns of men migrants. Certainly, they have the common concern if you lose your wage or your employment and your livelihood, that is a major common concern. But you also have other concerns if you lose, for example, the uh, where to live because that was associated with your work and you no longer have access to that, for example. Then there are issues not just of where you will live, but physical security. There are a whole range of other issues in terms of, uh, you know, your uh, reproductive health, your uh, other concerns, which are basically not really uh, taken into account by most governments, because uh, migration policies, internal and external migration policies in most governments are still heavily, you know, the male breadwinner model, they're still gender blind in that sense. And so the specific problems of women internal migrants are rarely taken into consideration. Even now, today in India, we just had the Indian finance minister uh, announce some very little tiny few measures for migrant workers. But you could see that the model she was using was that of the young male breadwinner as the migrant, rather than a lot of women who are also involved as migrant workers. One major concern that I want to highlight, and I think it's going to become more important in the near future, is in the advanced economies, the dangers of an early reversal to austerity. In a lot of the uh, rich countries, we're seeing very large uh, stimulus measures. Uh, of course, they appear larger than they actually are. In some cases, I think Japan and other countries have sort of inflated the numbers a bit. Uh, but nonetheless, they're very large. They're certainly much larger than anything we have seen since the Great uh, Recession of 2008, and probably in most cases they are larger than that. Uh, and there's very significant monetary measures as well. Sometimes the monetary measures in the US, the UK, and so on come to 30 to 40 percent of GDP already in just a few months. But there are dangers of a, of a reversal to austerity. You know, so basically. Uh, the power structures, the powers that be feel when there's a crisis that, okay, now we better do something. And so they actually uh, advance some money. But the minute they think that they're over the hump, there is very quickly a return to austerity. And that has all kinds of uh, implications. But in the developing world, it's even worse. We are already in austerity. In the middle of a crisis, we are imposing austerity. Governments are cutting down spending because of what I talked about earlier, that collapse of fiscal space, governments that had borrowed externally are facing massive problems of repayment. Others worry that if they do anything that will upset global finance, there's going to be an even more capital flight and the currency will collapse and there will be a domestic financial crisis. So whether for real or imagined reasons, governments in the developing world are unwilling to spend much. South Africa, which had announced a 10% uh, fiscal stimulus, and of course, at least 6% of it is actual fiscal spending, turns out to be spending new spending relatively little, only about 3.5%. India, which has announced a 10% fiscal stimulus, it turns out it's not fiscal at all. Most of it is monetary measures. There's hardly any new spending. The little that has been announced so far comes to maybe maximum less than 1% of GDP, which is nothing. It's not really going to address this complete downslide. But also because state revenues are in a mess, uh, 
the instinct of governments is to spend less at a time uh, and rather than to spend more. We're precisely at a time when nobody else is spending, so governments have to spend more. That's the only way you will save economies from complete collapse. You find that governments are actually spending less. Now, what does that mean? It means, first of all, worsening public employment conditions. So wage cuts, wage delays, uh, layoffs of workers, all of that is happening in, in different parts of the developing world. And women are disproportionately employed in public employment, you probably know. Uh, and so again, women are more likely to be in that situation where they experience wage cuts or layoffs or other adverse uh, impact on their employment. Worse conditions for worker women who are in the more exposed activities. Now, uh, it's not just in the healthcare, of course, in healthcare, but we know that in many developing countries, the healthcare workers, frontline workers are being forced to engage in this work. Uh, cleaning workers, catering workers are being forced to do all of this without adequate protection, without PPE, without even often sanitizers and gloves and the minimum things that you need to protect yourself. Uh, sales and distribution activities where a lot of women dominate, especially in retail sales, again, similar issues and overworking because in fact, the concerns about having uh, you know, enough workers in, in those sectors where you really need them, because right now these are the frontline activities in the pandemic, means that those who are there and are able to work are forced to overwork, go in for very, very long shifts. And then when they get sick, then they're out of it. And then the next lot is being forced to overwork. So it's actually a, a very counterproductive strategy of instead of expanding that employment, you're trying to reduce it. And at the same time, you're exposing them to worse and worse conditions. And there is enough evidence now from different parts of uh, uh, different countries that, in fact, women workers are facing the brunt of this. Austerity also means reduced access to public services, especially health and education. Now, we've all been through 20 years of this, so I don't have to tell you more about this. And I don't have to tell you how that has a very clear gender implication uh, when you actually reduce these public services. Uh, the greater reliance on unpaid labor of women and older girls for the care services, the tutoring of children and all of those things, I think I'd mentioned that. And that of course only grows when you have serious health concerns. And when people are told also to self-isolate at home, uh, to uh, quarantine at home and, and all of those kinds of things. The inadequate attention to other health concerns is a very, very big issue. And it has simply not uh, most governments don't seem to have understood how important that is. I know in India, this is a huge problem. I've already mentioned this, but it's also true. We were hearing about countries in Africa, other countries in Southeast Asia, that other health issues are being dramatically ignored. And this has massive implications, particularly women's health concerns. The reproductive health concerns are very, very big, but also other concerns for of women which you know, anyway, tend to underplay their own health conditions. They tend to go later to see doctors. They tend to underreport their symptoms. They do not declare morbidity as much as uh, men do and so on. So all of the, uh, those have become more significant now. In lockdowns, there's a lot of domestic violence. The reports are coming in. There is an increase in reporting in some areas and there is a decline in reporting in other areas because women are scared to report because they're actually still locked at home uh, with their uh, oppressors. So it's, it's a real concern, uh, this uh, domestic violence. And I have already talked about the intersectionality issues, the mi minorities, other disadvantaged groups in India, lower castes, those with disabilities typically ignored in situations like this and so on. The frontline health work worker, it's just worth noting this, Almost, well, two out of every three health workers in the 104 countries that the WHO studied are women, okay? And you can see this, uh, uh, this is the region-wise disaggregation. It's only in um, the European region, I think, that there are more women doctors than men, physicians, okay? Otherwise, always the doctors dominate, the men dominate, and for nurses, the women dominate, overwhelmingly dominate, as you can see, for nurses across all the regions between you know two thirds to four fifths to even more of nurses are women 
And there are very strong gender gaps, okay? So uh, the data show that women on uh, women health workers on average on 28% less than men, but there's a lot of occupational segregation, as I've said. So there are more male physicians, dentists, pharmacists, more women nurses and midwives. This is, okay? Uh, in, in the private sector, more women are like, more men are likely to be in highly paid jobs, Privately, more women are likely to be in low paid jobs, not just nurses, but you know, personal care workers and, and so on. In the current pandemic, it has been found that more women health, health workers, both the paid and the unpaid, are likely to be exposed to infection without, oh my God, I've been going on for too long, I have to hurry up without adequate protection. Okay, there is an issue of globalization of care work. Let me go through this very quickly and because I think it's quite interesting and important. There is an already existing phenomenon of the globalization of care work. We have global value chains in the care economy, and these are very much the product of neoliberal policies uh, of, you know, uh, that have created the need for paid care workers in some se sectors, countries, and the push for women to go out there and work for their families to survive in the sending countries. So nurse migration is a very typical example from the Philippines. It's the world's largest supplier of temporary migrant nurses to the US, which is the world's largest demander. But this is obviously affected by the political economy of healthcare in both of these countries and the wages and working conditions. 80% of all female cross-border migrant workers are domestic workers, which is also care work, but it's based in the home, not in institutions. And so you have a global value chain of work in which states play an active role. The sending countries play an active role in, in some cases, encouraging and even pushing women. The receiving countries, again, play an active role in determining which kinds of women can come and the conditions under which they can work. We all know that migrant care workers typically, typically get paid less, but there is this value chain, you know, from, let us say, the migrant worker who is resident as a domestic worker in, in a Western country, who then, is able to pay for a domestic worker to look after her own children, let's say in Metro Manila. And that domestic worker is able to, who has come from a rural area in the Philippines, is able to pay somebody or perhaps get her sister or her mother to look after her own children in her own place of origin, in her rural area. So there is this global value chain with the unpaid labor of a typical woman worker at the bottom. Now, this has been a major form of the subsidization of accumulation in the North. And I think we have to keep emphasizing this because nobody accepts this, nobody recognizes this. This global value chain in care has really subsidized Northern accumulation. But the other interesting thing is that depending on how many women migrants you send out, the remittances coming into your country tend to be much more stable because male migrants tend to work in manufacturing and construction and those uh, lose very quickly in a period of recession, whereas women are in care services and domestic work, which are, and, and to a lesser extent, entertainment services, and these are to a lesser extent impacted by uh, the downswing. So you see that, for example, here I've compared two sets of countries. Uh, the left side, it's Mexico versus Philippines, Mexico, the blue bars. And so Mexico, the remittances really suffered during the global financial crisis and only subsequently after about seven years, they recover. Uh, Philippines, it keeps increasing throughout, okay? Bangladesh and Sri Lanka, similar. Uh, Mexico has dominantly male migrants, Philippines has dominantly women migrants, okay? Similarly, in, in Asia, you have Bangladesh, dominantly male migrants, Sri Lanka, dominantly female migrants. And in Sri Lanka, it's a continuous increase in uh, Bangladesh, again, there was a big decline in two phases, and particularly one recent phase, but also the phase of uh, the global financial crisis. So the pattern, the gendered pattern of migration actually makes a big difference for remittances. Okay, now care work is actually a necessity and an opportunity. And I think the pandemic has exposed the fact that we really have a, need a massive investment in care across all societies. This is also important because, you know, it's one of those sectors that is not, uh, where technology is not going to take away the job. Care is relational. It's, it's not about, you know, automation, robotization, et cetera, removing the possibilities of work. Care is relational. It requires flexible responses. So you can never replace it. It can add, it can assist, it can increase productivity, but you cannot replace it. 
And in fact, what you will need with changing with demography and social changes and public health concerns, you will need more and more skilled care services. It's very important that public intervention, public investment rises to provide these because private markets underprovide. And so we really need to recognize the importance of care work. We have to invest in skills and training for care, reward care workers, give them good wages and working conditions, make sure the technologies are enablers of the provision of care services, not the controllers, because this actually serves public purpose in multiple levels. Now, there are a bunch of other concerns, but I think I've really talked for far too long, I'm sorry. Um, we can come back to these issues if there are questions. I've talked about the, the some of these the already, the food crisis and unpaid work. The stigma and discrimination associated with fears of virus, which is part of the intersectional inequalities that I had mentioned. One very interesting fact that I came across recently, you know, across the world, men are much more likely to die of COVID-19 than women, okay? It's just one of those physiological things, except in India and Pakistan, where so far, disproportionately, women die more than men, which is an interesting fact worth exploring further, I think. Final point, and I'm sorry to have gone on forever, but let me just quickly outline how I think we have to plan for the future and hope for the future, even though at the moment it seems very depressing and it seems that things are really bad. But we have to think of a new way of doing things. We need a new deal. And people have talked about a global new deal. They've talked about a green new deal. I'm basically saying it has to be global, but it has to be multicolored. Okay. So what's the new deal? It requires, first of all, recovery based on significantly increased public expenditure, dramatically increased. I mean, Roosevelt uh, increased public spending in the US three times in very few years, okay? So huge increases in public spending. It has to include regulation, controlling what finance can do, controlling what a private investment can do, ensuring that labor markets are regulated properly, ensuring that the environment uh, regulations uh, prevent excessive exploitation of nature and congestion and, and over extraction and so on, and redistribution, uh, absolutely critical, okay? So it has to be multicolored. What does that mean? Green, everybody knows, you know, you have to, and I've added blue because blue is about water. And I think we neglect the issue of water when we talk about only green. So recognizing, respecting, preserving the environment and addressing climate change challenges. Purple, why? Purple is, Ipek Il Kakaran talked about the purple economy, recognizing the significance of care, rewarding paid care work, as I already said, recognizing and reducing and redistributing unpaid care work, representing care workers, giving them a voice. Uh, red, okay? Red, I would say, because it's really about in reducing inequalities. Inequalities in assets, through uh, in access to income, in access to food, access to essential public services, across all these different dimensions, gender, race, ethnicity, caste location, this has to be done through strongly redistributive measures, taxation policies, uh, tax, taxes on wealth, taxes on inheritance, taxes on multinational companies, which are currently getting away with no taxing at all. The digital companies have made huge profits in this period of the pandemic, and they barely pay any taxes. So we have to actually bring back taxation of all of these. And of course, all of this means it has to be global. We need an appropriate international architecture with controlled finance and capital flows, revised rates for, true, for trade and IPRs, and a whole range of different structures that will actually enable a more equitable society with good quality employment generation. Okay, I will stop here because I've already talked for far too long, and we can get into any questions that people have. I Thank you, Jyoti. Thank you for uh, taking us through this uh, range of issues that are related to, to you know, gender sort of importance and how this crisis is playing out. Uh, there are uh, some questions already, and I'm sure more are coming. Uh, okay, because how do I unshare this? I'm trying to, and it's not uh, happening. Just uh, wait. I think we can do that. Okay. Uh, you can, yeah, you can stop mm -hmm. sharing your screen. Yeah. Yes, uh, thank you. There we go. All right. Um, where was I? Yeah. All right. So there are quite a few questions. Uh, actually, they cover quite a range of issues. Uh, as uh, 
as you have in your lecture. <laughs> so, so I think you you uh, you called for this. And now let's start. Uh, so, how much of the food crisis is down to affordability, and how much of it is due to disruptions in supply chains? So, this is one very different question. It's not so much about gender, but uh, uh, I mean, yeah, uh, you have. Uh, why don't you deal with that as well? Uh, uh, there are a couple of questions on self-help groups. What is the importance of self-help groups promoted by the government? And there is another one. There are many fake SHGs and SHG accounts. What can be done to track such cases so that the benefits go only to genuine SHGs? Um, then there's a question about uh, Jandan accounts. What do you th think of the, you know, 500 rupees for three months that the government offered to 20 crore women? Uh, what do you think is uh, how, how useful it is or how, I mean, good enough for uh, or Pradeep or what do you think of it? You want to take this? Okay, so uh, these are broadly India specific and uh, about the, let me do the food first. Right now, it is affordability. Right now, the food crisis is because people cannot afford the food to access in most countries, okay? But it is evolving into an issue of supply shortages because we are getting reports from different countries about how this has affected not just harvesting, but distribution, uh, the ability of farmers to reach markets, the ability of, uh, you know, the, the transport of the food and so on. So. In the next few months, we can expect to see the impact of the disruption of the supply chain. It's not happening immediately, but it will. Right now, it is very much a problem of affordability. The SHGs. So, you know, this is very different uh, a set of concerns. The fake SHG problem is, so look, what, what is it that they get? Uh, an SHG, when it has a bank linkage, it is able to access some bank finance. and even if it is entirely fake, at some point the renewals have to be, the repayments have to be made. That is to say, it may not be a group, it might just be one person with a bunch of fake names or what happens. Nonetheless, the repayments have to be made. And these are not soft loans by any means. These are actually fairly high cost loans. So I, I wouldn't see that as necessarily a, a major concern. The Jandhan rupee uh, 500 rupees first of all 500 rupees is an insult in a situation where you have deprived people of their livelihoods and their incomes you would have to give them a minimum of let's say 7000 rupees per household over the period where you have deprived them of their capacity to earn but the jandhan accounts anyway do not necessarily belong to the poor the trouble with the Jandan accounts is that when they were done, the whole purpose was just to ensure that you have got a whole number of accounts. Banks were incentivized to create as many as possible. There have been multiple Jandan accounts created. Even today, there are about 18% that are completely dormant, that have not uh, ever been used, or that have only a very small amount, let's say 100 rupees in them, uh, and which are really not accessed at all. Many middle class people have Jandhan accounts. A lot of them, people I know, have received SMSs about how they've got 500 rupees into their account. So it is neither does it cover all of the people who need it, uh, nor does it actually provide mon in money of any significant value. Uh, 500 rupees is, is too small and pathetic an amount to qualify as relief in the current situation. All right. Uh, there are actually quite a few new questions, so <laughs> let me just <laughs> get a hang of this. Uh, but before, okay, let me give you one one more lot. Uh, so there are uh, there's one question about domestic violence. Uh, how do you think the issue of domestic violence can be addressed in a situation where police and authorities have undue powers? Uh, legal activists are suggesting police as a measure of last resort. Right. So, you know, how do you deal with it? Yeah, uh, this is a really tough one. Yeah, because uh, it's true. I mean, you know, the police are often the worst perpetrators of violence as well. And uh, for many reasons, people are unwilling to approach. Uh, also, because, you know, you don't necessarily want the, 
the imprisonment of the person and so on. It's a very complex issue and I don't know how to deal with it. But I think one of the real issues here is also the absence of shelters for women. Safe, secure shelters that do, um, that provide, uh, uh, that are easy for women to access and to stay in without stigma or concern. And I think uh, if you really need a strong public intervention, that is one of the important areas, not just in India, but across the world, where you really have to ensure that there are sufficient numbers of shelters for women to go to when the problem becomes too significant. Okay, there, there is I think, quite a few questions on uh, unpaid work, domestic work mm -hmm. that women do. Uh, washing is essential protection need against COVID. Women are tasked with tasks, uh, uh, take the burden of you know, procuring water, fetching water, yes, yes. particularly when they don't have, you know, water taps in their houses. People have to buy water in many places. So yeah. protection comes at an additional cost. What do you think? Yes, uh, yes absolutely. Okay. Yes. Uh, wait, wait, wait. Jyoti, there are a couple okay. of more okay. on, on, on the domestic work. So let's take all of them together. Yeah. Is it possible to bring women's unpaid work in national income accounting, either as domestic workers or, you know, uh, okay. by accounting this is there any lesson that the lockdown and pandemic can teach us about this uh, and one more as most of the states are scraping scrapping labor laws for some years especially increasing working hours to 12 to 12 hours and so on what will be the condition of women workers given that they perform household chores disproportionately how will they work for longer hours okay. So water access is an absolutely critical issue, and it speaks volumes for the middle class orientation of the whole official COVID policy, that the exhortations are always designed for really a middle class life. Whereas we know that both in a large number of rural areas and in many of our urban congested settlements and so on, water is expensive, water is scarce, and it's really impossible to you know, keep, say, the two buckets that you have for the day uh, entirely for washing your hands and things like that. Uh, it's not just a question of the time spent in collecting water. It is also uh, the sheer difficulty of accessing it and storing sufficient amounts of it in what could be very small homes. And uh, so I think the, the ways in which people have said that you have to protect yourself from COVID are assuming a very Western or upper class uh, you know, West, uh, westernized, shall I say, lifestyle in large parts of the developing world. And we have heard uh, already from yesterday from Africa that that simply doesn't exist in large parts of, of the world, that it, you really have to have different ways of dealing with this problem. The issue of unpaid work in the national accounts is not really COVID related. And I'm not a big fan of including it in the national accounts. I don't, I think that would be a false sense of higher income. Okay, it's really um, not something that you can, uh, you can't so suddenly say, well, you know, you're actually the beneficiary of all this unpaid work. So your income is higher than you think. It's a bit of a double whammy. But not only do you have to do the unpaid work, but then you're, uh, credited as a consumer of this unpaid work so that your income is actually higher because of the fact that you're doing all this work for free. So I'm not a believer in uh, putting it into the system of national accounts. Instead, what I would argue is, you know, what typically people call the five R's. That is, you recognize it first of all, you uh, redistribute it as far as possible. You try and reduce the drudgery and the amount of time taken for it. You, um, you uh, represent it as far as possible, and you provide appropriate rewards for the work when you do redistribute. The scrapping of labor laws, I am fervently hoping that this will not get presidential assent. I think it would be obscene if it does, because it would actually be, I think it's unconstitutional. I think that the state governments should cannot be allowed to go against a, a hundred year history of labor legislation that is exactly in the opposite direction. So I am still hoping that the four state governments that have tried to undo the labor laws in India will not succeed in this. Um, so there are uh, some questions about the care work. Uh, interesting one, actually. Uh, particularly because of you know the health workers being uh, you know in the front line in this crisis. Uh, now you've 
uh, you mentioned taking care of caregivers in Ahmedabad. Nursing staff of government hospitals are on protest because wages and salaries have not been paid. Are there financial constraints or or what? And a similar uh, question. We have come to know in India that we need care workers the most. We are showering flowers on them. But do you think India is going to pay more or offer more social security to its workers in the care work? Given that we are doing away with labor laws, are we going to treat care workers as another reserve army of labor available for exploitation, or are we hopeful of some benefits to them? Yes, it's precisely what I said. You know, we're getting austerity, and austerity means that all of these public services actually have less money, and therefore they are taking it out by not paying their workers, including the frontline workers who are absolutely critical to deal with uh, what we are faced with today. It's care workers, Anganwari workers are not being paid in several state governments. Ashas are not being paid in many states. So uh, yes, I mean, the critical thing will not is not showering flowers and so on. It's actually to ensure that you have adequate, uh, well-paid, properly remunerated health workers operating in decent conditions and with all the protective equipment that they need. I think that goes without saying. Unfortunately, the tendency of this government and a bunch of others has been actually to reduce the spending on these, in, even in this critical time. Uh, there are, there's one interesting question on home-based workers. As majority of home-based workers are women, and given the present crisis, uh, you know, where will they be absorbed and what will be their prospects after the lockdown, especially in the government industry, which are dependent on exports? Yeah, this is a very serious concern. And in fact, uh, the prospects do look very grim. There's no question about it. Uh, so it will take a long time for such industries to actually revive. When they do revive, the chances are that if anything, the home-based workers will have a slight advantage over those who have to be brought into factories because it will be more expensive to actually do all the conditions, the social, the physical distancing and so on that is required to maintain them in factories. So it is possible that home-based workers who were anyway extremely exploited and paid peace rate and uh, got very, very little for their uh, efforts would would find that they would be getting orders faster than a lot of people who had been employed in factories. But uh, on the whole, the prospects, I'm afraid, are grim for both. Um, I think there is one uh, more sort of question on SHGs that, you know, why is it that uh, we are only thinking of credit providing credit to SHGs and not uh, trying to strengthen them for having, you know, entrepreneurial activities, you know, building them as micro enterprises and so on. And why this entire focus is on, on credit, particularly when, you know, these are supposed to be groups of women who hardly have any savings and, uh, you know, very little ability to pay uh, the credit. Well, I mean, SAGs are uh, savings and loan groups, right? So uh, they have to be about credit. I think the question really is that are we providing them enough credit to enable them to start an enterprise? And I think, uh, you know, in principle, it is possible to think of treating them as cooperatives, uh, a bit like uh, the Kerala model, where you are actually trying to generate a federation of these self-help groups that is into productive enterprise. But that means that the credit has to be provided to them accordingly. At the moment, a lot of the self-help groups, the savings bank linkage is actually a very short term one. It's, it, it's very uh, relatively small loan, loans with very high turnover, very quick repayment. Whereas if you actually think of the Kutumbashri model in Kerala, it is based on a longer term horizon where you are allowing them to generate productive activities. And therefore you do find that the, the federation in Kerala, the Kutumbashri, that there are many more. There's a choir cooperative, there, is a, there are farming cooperatives, there are other, um, I think, coconut product cooperatives and so on that have emerged from these. So it is possible, but it would need a different, it's not that you're giving credit, but the terms on which you're giving the credit. Are you giving it uh, sufficiently and for sufficient length for it to be used as a productive investment? 
Okay, there is, uh, uh, okay, there are two questions on, uh, so one is about women's uh, sort of lack of representation in the leadership positions. How important is that and, and uh, what uh, can be done about it? And another question on women's movements. How strong are women's solidarity movements across different countries? Are there examples of uh, these movements, you know, uh, as being pro uh, sort of strong enough to to take on some of these challenges and bring about change? This is interesting. Um, the lack of representation at which level of government, of course, it matters, but. Globally, I think it's been noticed. There have been lots of social media discussion about it, that the countries that have responded best to the pandemic happen to be led by women. Uh, New Zealand, uh, I think a bunch of Scandinavian countries and, and so on, even Germany. Uh, the, the responses have generally been better. Uh, whereas the countries that are led by uh, egocentric strongmen have responded very badly. And I don't have to name them. I think everybody knows <laughs> which countries are experiencing very bad uh, resp public responses to COVID. Uh, I happen to live in one myself. Uh, which, um, so yes, there is something clearly, uh, <laughs> there is a pattern here if we want to look for it. Women's solidarity movements. This is a very interesting thing. And I think it would vary hugely across countries. Uh, uh, What's happened is that the lockdown has been uh, very damaging from the point of view of abilities to associate and abilities to organize and mobilize and talk to people. Because uh, this ability to do things online is the privilege of a very small group of people in any country. And so it, I think a lot of the women's solidarity movements have actually received a setback in the last period of lockdown because closures immobility, the lack of ability to interact face-to-face, uh, -face, all of these make a big difference and they do affect uh, your ability to come together and, and develop social movements. On the other hand, I mean, you know, human ingenuity, uh, I hope, will, uh, will uh, overcome this. And I think subsequently, we will probably see much more of an emergence of women's movements. Um, there are actually, again, a whole bunch of new questions. <laughs> All right. So uh, uh, there's a question. Uh, you We talked about the home-based workers. There's a question about that, another question about it. Uh, as a craft sector like embroidery, weaving, employ many workers, uh, many women, uh, do you see better prospects for that kind of a sector as home-based work may be preferred when other employment is lost and home-based work is considered safe? Uh, Can you give me a yeah. set of questions? Yeah. yeah. Uh, then there is a question. As states are opening liquor shops, since there is fall in state revenue and no help from the center, the cases of domestic violence are already rising, hidden and unreported too. What are your views about opening up of, uh, of liquor shops? Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, the craft sector, you know, unfortunately, all of these sectors have really experienced massive blows. I think we have, to, I don't think everybody realizes the extent of economic devastation that we are going to experience. Because at the moment, it's all still in limbo, you know, everyone's it's stuck at home, and you haven't come out and realized it. Uh, you see migrants on the road, you, you hear people complaining, but it's still relatively small. Uh, we haven't realized the kind of economic collapse that is going to occur, not just in India, but across many developing countries. And I think in that, craft sector also will be affected. Craft sector also, let's face it, is a relatively uh, luxury good. You know, it's not really something for mass consumption. And uh, at this point, all these sectors, many of them would actually, we know that already many of these traditional crafts, there have been reports from the ground, are actually drying up. And uh, there's, there's no possibility for their revival if one generation actually abandons it completely. So I, I don't think that the craft sector is something we can sit back and relax and say, oh, it'll be fine because they do it at home and things. I think we would have to do very proactive public measures 
to ensure that they actually sustain and remain and, and survive. The liquor shop issue is a very complicated one. Um, it's unfortunate in India that you know liquor has to be uh, associated with violence. It's unnecessary and unfortunate, and it speaks to some lack of maturity in our population that we cannot, you know, accept the consumption of liquor as something normal and see it instead as something that has to be overindulged and inevitably then associated with the violence, particularly against women. It's also the case that domestic violence was on the increase. Uh, it was uh, during this period of the pandemic, also because of frustrations and people getting upset that you know they're losing incomes and trying to take it out on whoever is near them in, in the worst possible way. It is possible that opening up of the liquor shops will uh, be associated with greater domestic violence, but it's this is a period when the state governments are really literally left with no choice because we have a central government that has absolutely denied them any revenues, even their own money that they owe, they have not paid yet. And they've not given them any additional funds to do the minimum that they need to cope with this immense tragedy. And their own revenues have collapsed to one tenth of what they were a year ago. So they are desperate for any funds. So if we, you can't say close the liquor shops without ensuring that state governments are actually provided enough resources to deal with this in other ways. And I think uh, anyone who says, well, you know, just close this and, and keep everything else the way it is, is not recognizing the immense financial constraints that state governments in India face today. Thank you, Jyoti. Thank you. I think that covers most of it. Uh, thank you. I, I, I must say this uh, this lecture series couldn't be couldn't have been complete without this lecture, without uh, I mean this the, I mean the, all the issues that you covered. I mean they they, they are so critical to uh, what social scientists uh, any understanding as social scientists that we should have of the society, but how the, these issues have become particularly critical in the present crisis. Uh, so so. So thank you very much, uh, and thank you everybody for for joining uh, uh, the lecture. We had excellent uh, audience today, uh, and uh, uh, I just want to remind everybody that we have two more lectures in this series uh, 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 this week, and uh, they are both going to be very very interesting lectures. Tomorrow we have Alden Willow, who's who's going to be talking about uh, food systems, the whole issue of food sovereignty, and now you know things like food self-sufficiency are suddenly uh, becoming uh, issues that are widely accepted as important important uh, aspects which shouldn't just be you know uh, brushed aside as they were by a lot of people uh, who, who you know. Uh, who are in this, uh, who work in this area. So, so I think uh, uh, tomorrow's lecture is also going to be very interesting. I hope uh, our audience would come back again tomorrow. Uh, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Jayati once again. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, have a nice evening. Yeah. Bye, Bye. everyone. Bye. Thank you.